So when you apply for a driving license and you attain a driving license, before you drive, it's paramount that you have that driving license with you. And that's because you need to know which things you have to fulfill and which things you're not allowed to do. Because if you do those matters, then perhaps that driving license, it will be revoked. We study the invalidators of wudu. Why? The reason why we study the invalidators of wudu is because perhaps a person who prays salah and his wudu is broken. And also we study the invalidators of a salah because if a person was praying salah and passed wind, for example, then the salah is invalid. And also you study the invalidators of psalm or those things which break a person's fast. So when you're fasting, you don't do something which leads to your fast being broken. And also we study those matters which are impermissible during Hajj or for Ihram, like using perfume when you're in a state of Ihram. So from these four matters which we have mentioned, the invalidates of Salah and Wudu and fasting and ihram, which of them is the most important? From these four, that which is more important Jama. are those matters which invalidate a person's Islam. This is the most important thing to study. Because if you fear that your salah is invalid, or your wudu, your fasting, or your ihram, or your hajj is invalid, it's even more important that you fear that perhaps your Islam may be invalidated. And therefore, this is extremely important for you to understand those matters which invalidate your Islam. And various terms are used to refer to invalidators. Sometimes we say, sometimes we say nawaqid, meaning something which falsifies. And sometimes we say mufsidat, i.e. something which corrupts. And then we say mubtilat, again, that which invalidates. Is there any difference between these different terms? There's no difference. All of them mean the same thing. And if a person says, who amongst the well-known trusted scholars wrote regarding the invalidators of Islam, I want to know who wrote regarding this. And it wasn't just one scholar who wrote about the invalidators of Islam, rather every single scholar, any scholar who authored in fiqh, they speak about Ahkam al-Murtad, the rulings pertaining to the apostate. And so every one of those ulama who wrote regarding fiqh, they wrote regarding the invalidators of Islam. So these 10 invalidators of Islam, are they matters which are being differed over or not? These 10 invalidators of a person's Islam, there is a complete unanimous agreement amongst the ulama of Islam regarding these 10. And then are the invalidators of Islam limited to only 10 or are there more? So the answer is that there are more than 10 invalidators of Islam. However, these 10 are the most important. And who said this? Or what's the evidence? Now, so if we say that there are other invalidators in addition to these 10 invalidators of Islam, even Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah himself, in his treatise, Nuaqib al-Islam, he himself mentioned that these invalidators of Islam are those which are most prevalent. And then, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, when he entitled his Risala, he said, the 10 invalidators of Al-Islam. Why did he not say that these are some of the invalidators of Al-Islam? Why limit them to the number 10? So the reason why the author, Imam al-Mujaddid Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, why he mentioned the number 10, even there, or even though there are more than 10 invalidators, but he mentioned the number 10. Because if you look at the Quran and the Sunnah, and the style of the Quran and the Sunnah in terms of teaching, is to mention numbers no. which limit something. If a particular number is mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah, do we have to stop at that number? Or can we increase above that number? We have to look at the, at the other evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah. And if, and if we find from the other evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah that there are more than the number of those issues which are mentioned, then that means that that number which was mentioned in one particular evidence, it does not, lim it does not limit the issue. However, if we find from the other evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah 
that no further issues are mentioned above what has been enumerated, then that means that that number, it limits the number of issues. To give a, an, a, an example, the arkan or the pillars of Islam are five. And we researched the other evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah and we found that there are no more pillars of Islam and therefore the number five, it limits the pillars of Islam to five only. And also the six pillars of Iman, they also limit the pillars of Iman to six only. And also the doors of Jannah or the gates of Jannah, they are limited. However, the 10 people who were given the glad tidings of Jannah and they were named as 10. If we look at the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah, do we find other people in addition to those 10 who were also given the glad tidings of paradise during their lifetime? Yes, we do. And therefore, limiting those people who are given the glad tidings to paradise during their lifetime to 10 only, we cannot do this. So why is it that if there are more than 10 people who are given the glad tidings to Jannah and we cannot limit those people to 10 only, then why did the Prophet ﷺ mention 10 people and he mentioned that number 10 who were given the glad, glad tidings to Jannah? So this was because the method of the Prophet ﷺ in teaching the Sahaba and how effective this method was that those people, they know to memorize at least 10, those 10. It's like, for example, and so if the Prophet ﷺ left the city and the Sahaba left the city, they have that number in their mind that they are 10 and they can enumerate who those 10 people are. It's like, for example, when we're teaching, we'll say, memorize three benefits from the lesson. Even though there are more than three benefits in the lesson, but we limit it to three as a method of teaching, so it's easy to memorize and recall. And so the author of the treatise, and Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimullah, he utilizes the prophetic method of teaching. And this is why he wrote various treaties and he said, al qawaid al arba the four important principles, and al usul al and the three fundamental principles. So he mentions numbers like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do so. Of course, the three principles which relate to the three questions in the grave, they're limited to three. As for the 10 invalidates of Islam, the invalidates of Islam are not limited to 10, there are more. And if a person said, that I want, to, I want you to summarize for me these 10 invalidates of Islam, or I want you to summarize for me all the invalidates of Islam, is it possible to do so? Yes, inshallah. Because our ulama, they also summarized for us the invalidates of Islam. And it's possible for a person to summarize every and all the invalidates of Islam in four main invalidators. And that is invalidators which relate to people's statements, actions, beliefs, and doubts. So the invalidators which pertain, pertain to a person's speech is like a person who insults Islam. And as for actions which invalidate a person's Islam, like sihr, black magic. And as for invalidators which pertain to a person's belief, like a person believing that the Prophet wasallam was not the final messenger of Islam. As for doubts, like a person doubting the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam or a person doubting the existence of Allah. And then after this, do the invalidators of Islam necessitate that we then make a judgment of kufr upon a person or not? Was the intent of the author when he wrote this book that we go making judgments of kufr upon the people or that he himself used to make judgments of kufr upon the people? And the answer is no. Why is it no? And this is because the author himself in this treatise, when he mentioned the 10 invalidates of Islam, he said that it is upon you to be aware and cautious of these 10 invalidators and to warn other people. 
from falling into these ten invalidators. And so he outlined his intent in writing this treaty. And that is for you to firstly avoid yourself and then warn others from falling into them. Not that you make judgments of kufr and takfir upon the people. And so we should not wait until people fall into these invalidates of Islam. Rather, we have to warn the people and teach the people. After this, what are the invalidators of Islam? Who knows? I mean, what are the ten invalidators which the author has mentioned? And if everybody mentions one invalidator. So when we say mocking the religion, meaning mocking or joking about or amusing over or telling funny stories regarding what? Regarding Allah, His Messenger, or any one of the messengers or the religion or the ayat of Allah, whether they are universal ayat or ayat of the Quran or any aspect of the Sharia. And regarding this, Allah subhanahu wa mentioned in the Quran, Qul abillahi wa ayatihi wa rasuli kuntum tastahzi'un. He said, is it regarding Allah and his, uh, and, his, and his ayat and his message that you used to joke over? Meaning, is there nothing left for you to joke regarding and to laugh about except Allah and his messenger and his ayat? Then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that you have disbelieved after your iman. And sometimes a person might say, and he's a Muslim, he say, but I had no idea that insulting the Lord Allah, that this is kufr, I had no idea. And subhanAllah, if you do not know that insulting Allah is kufr, then what do you know about Islam? And therefore, all oh brothers, this is something which is very dangerous that we should not read ayat and a hadith except that we are fearful and scared and that we stop at the limits which are mentioned in these evidences. Secondly, slaughtering an animal for other than Allah and any act of ibadah which is directed to other than Allah, then this is shirkun akbar. As for the slaughtering for other than Allah means slaughtering an animal which is based upon love and exalting the one in whose name the animal is being slaughtered. And then the third one, the brother mentioned, blah, the dog. And then the third one, oh, every day you recite 17 times throughout the day. What do you recite? You say, and not those people who earned your anger, nor those people who were led astray. 17 times in the day you say this. And any person, to whom the message of Islam was conveyed, and then he did not accept the message of Islam, then that person is a Kafir, regardless of whether that person was a Jew or a Christian or other than them. And when a person says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, I bear witness there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, you are saying that I reject and I negate and I deny or disbelieve in everything else which is worshipped besides Allah and I affirm my worship for Allah. So you have to reject and, and disbelieve and negate the worship of all of the other false deities. And then you say, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولًا I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is the worship of Allah and his final messenger. And therefore, if anybody comes along and the message of Islam was conveyed to them after the Prophet was sent to the people and they do not accept the Prophet as being the Messenger of Allah, then they are outside the fold of Islam. Regardless of who that person is, Yahudi, Jew, Christian, fire a worship, or anybody else. And Allah subhanahu wa mentions in the Quran and He addresses the Yahud and the Nasara. He said, Ya Ahl al Kitab, O people of the scriptures, meaning Al Yahud wal Nasara. And addressing them, He says, the meaning of which is, Why do you disbelieve? And so who made the ruling of disbelief and kufr upon the Yahud and the Nasar? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul that nobody hears of me, be it a Jew or a Christian, except that he has to believe in me. 
However, does this mean a necessity that we have to now go kill them? So does this mean now that we have to kill them? No, by Allah. Does this mean that we have to, we don't fulfill our trust and our contracts? No, we have to fulfill our trust and contracts. But does it mean that we have to like, insult them and swear at them? No. And also, does it mean that we laugh at the non-Muslims and we insult the non-Muslims? No. Rather, we have to teach and call and sincerely guide and advise the non-Muslims. <coughs> and we explain to them that that which you are upon, the Prophet Musa السلام, Prophet Isa السلام, they call to its opposite. They call to the worship of Allah alone. And in fact, we have to show the non-Muslims that we have a, com uh, a compassion over them. Or regarding them. And we say to them that we are fearful and scared for your sake, that you may enter into the fire. And so we have to be sincere in our advice to the kuffar. And then the next invalidator is a sihr. And the sahir, the one who utilizes a sihr, he disbelieves with a major form of disbelief, al kufr al akbar. Because the sahir, does not worship Allah, rather he worships shaitan. And therefore we cannot be accepting of a sihr, black magic. And also if we are aware of a person who is practicing <coughs> sihr, then we have to report his affair to the authorities. And neither are we allowed to enter into the gatherings or the websites of the magicians. Oh. And neither are we allowed to communicate with them or check uh, magazines or journals or newspapers which contains any of this. We said at the beginning of our lesson that the Nawaqid of Islam, the invalidates of Islam, they go back to four main things. First of them is statements which invalidate a person's Islam, like insulting Allah's Messenger. And then there are other invalidators which are action-based, like sihr. And then other invalidators which are dependent upon a person's belief, aqeedah. And this is like a person believing that he has to aid the non-Muslims in the killing of Muslims. And nowadays, between the Muslim countries and the non-Muslim countries, there are agreements and contracts and treaties that we have to abide by. And when it comes to interacting with the non-Muslims, the people have been divided over three groups, two extremes, and then one which is correct and in the middle. So there's one extreme which interacts with the non-Muslims by insulting them and swearing at them and taking their wealth. And then there's another extreme which partakes in the festivals and the celebrations of the non-Muslim. And the correct position is that which is in the middle, that we fulfill our trusts and contracts and promises towards them, and we do not violate their wealth by taking it or swearing at them and insulting them. But at the same time, we don't partake in their Eids and their festivals, and we are committed to have between us and them transactions, buying and selling. And we, we are sincere in advice towards them. And we call them to Allah. And in interacting with the non-Muslims, we have to be upon the same methodology and the same manner in which the Prophet ﷺ and his Sahaba used to interact with them. Uh, there are people out there who may have some sins and they admit to being sinners. And so this person who is sinning, what does he want after his sin? He wants to repent and seek forgiveness. And so seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repent to him. But he does not seek forgiveness from Allah, neither does he repent to Allah, nor does he want to invoke Allah. So then who do you call upon? He goes to the inhabitants of the grave and he invokes them. And had the inhabitants of the grave had any ability to help, they would have helped their own selves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is as-Sameer, the all-hearing. 
and he's Al-Mujib, the one who answers the supplications. And he's Al-Qareeb, he's close in his answering of the supplications. And he's Al-Rahim, he's the most merciful, the one who bestows mercy. And he ordered and commanded us to invoke him and seek forgiveness from him. And he did not order us to invoke the inhabitants of the grave. And this person who is going and invoking the inhabitants of the grave, he ties himself, he travels, he searches. But why is he tiring himself? Why is he searching? Why doesn't he seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make his actions sincere upon the tawheed? And so Allah will forgive him and answer his supplications. Even the kuffar of Quraysh, when they were in a time of severe difficulty, they would call out to Allah, مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Making their actions sincerely for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He did not place between Him and between creation, people in the middle or interceders. Rather, He ordered the people to direct their worship to Him. Even Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He does not possess the right or the ability to intercede. And this is because on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will not begin a shafa'a until Allah Subh'ana gives him permission to do so. And this indicates and proves that a shafa'a is the sole and exclusive <coughs> right of Allah Subh'ana. In fact, after every adhan, we supplicate to Allah Subh'ana that he will give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that place or that status to make the shifa'a. It's not permitted for a person to fall out of the sharia of the Prophet ﷺ. So if a person believes that it is allowed to be external to the sharia of Muhammad ﷺ, then this is disbelief and it is major disbelief, kufr akbar. And this is because the Prophet ﷺ, he was sent to all humanity. In fact, he was sent to both, to both the jinn and mankind. If a person believes that there is a, a religion which is more worshipping, more pious, more guiding, better than the guidance of the Prophet وسلم, then this person leaves the fall of Islam. Or if a person believes that there is, a, there, is a, there, there is a set of laws which are better than the laws of Islam, or a person believes that there is a religion or a set of laws which are equal and similar or equal to the laws of Islam, then this is also kufr al-Hakim. And this is if he believes this. However, some people, may Allah guide us and guide them, if they hear from a particular scholar making a particular supplication, then they will take this supplication. Even though we know that the best supplication is that which were taught to us in the Quran and the Sunnah. For a person to completely turn away from the religion of Allah, meaning neither does he learn or know or do any actions. And what this means is that a person gives his back and turns away completely from the religion of, of Allah. He does not know anything about the religion of Allah. He doesn't even know regarding his own self being a Muslim, except mean, seen, lamb and mean. Meaning he does not know anything about Islam. If you were say to him, who is the who is the prophet of an Islam? He says, I don't know. If you say to him, come, learn, he does not want to learn. And how can he perform any actions without knowledge? And this is what the people of disbelief, they intend for the Muslims. For them to be completely removed and distanced from their religion such that they know nothing about Islam. And neither do they perform any of the actions of Islam. Also from the invalidates of Islam is a shirk, meaning a shirk al-akbar, major shirk, like worshipping the inhabitants of the grave, or worshipping the jinn, or fearing the jinn like the fear of Allah. Any act of ibadah which is directed to other than Allah, then this is shirk al-akbar. And then after this, the author mentioned to hate and despise something which the Prophet Sallallahu conveyed to us or something which Allah Subh'ana ordered us to do, meaning a person hates and despises something from the Sharia. And there's no way that a Muslim can hate or despise 
or dislike something from the Sharia. Rather, a person's mind or chest has to be open and easy with the laws and the commandments of the Sharia. Because Allah subhanahu wa mentioned the meaning of which is no, by your Lord, they will never believe until they make you judge in that which they differ over. And then they do not find any difficulty in that which you have judged with. And they have complete submission. So the Sheikh was teaching this issue in France. And he said one of the French students, when he heard this, that it's not allowed to hate something which Islam brings, <coughs> that, that French student said, Sheikh, Jazakallah khair. Because my wife, she hates polygamy. Meaning, he wanted to make a ruling of kufr upon her because she despises or hates polygamy. And we said, oh brothers, that we are learning these matters in order for us to be careful and avoid them and try to teach and warn others, not that we make rulings of kufr upon people. This isn't your affair, this is for the ulama. And this woman, she's not hating the law of Islam or she's, she doesn't despise or negate or deny the law of Islam in terms of the permissibility of polygamy, but her nature and the biology upon which Allah created her upon is that she doesn't want another woman or she doesn't want to share her husband with another woman. Her love and her ghira, her jealousy and her pride, it prevents her from wanting this thing. And so we have to understand that we study these matters to first ourselves fear and be cautious of these matters and then to teach and warn others. As for making rulings of kufr or takfir upon the people, then this is for the major ulama and also the Islamic courts and judges. And uh, we have to, and it's important for us, that we teach the people, we convey this religion to the people. Because the Prophet wasallam said, a person does not believe until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. And just as you don't want people to make judgments of kufr upon you or to misguide you, then similarly you have to be that person who reforms society and brings people back into Islam and warns them away from falsehood. And I ask Allah from His kindness and His grace that He shows us the truth as being the truth and he allows us to implement it. May peace and salutations be upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and jazakumullah khairan.